Okay, so I'll bring that discussion to the class. Okay, so I'll make a decision after the class. Oh, okay. Because it would like affect everyone, right? Yeah, because I mean, I had to be fair for everybody. So if most of them were able to submit on time, then then it's gonna be unfair if they put the time on it to the other uh, uh, group. I mean, let, let me let me have a discussion with everybody, and then I'll make a decision. Okay, so it looks like there's some uh, requests from some of you for a, an assignment uh, extension for today's uh, assignment, the one that was due today. Um, so I'm looking at the, I'll share the screen in a minute. Uh, so I'm looking at my, at the system right now, 18 of you submitted on time. Yeah, so it's about half of you. So, um, so what I'll do, I will give you, until Wednesday, if you submit it and you're not happy with your submission, you can resubmit. I will extend the, the submission time till Wednesday, uh, the time of the class. Yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, that was my uh, my bad in, in, in terms, I think I, I, I edited that assignment based on uh, our circumstances last last semester, I forgot to remove that piece. We cover everything uh, that you needed for the assignment in class. Uh, the problem, I think, what happened last Monday was that the video was not uh, recorded. So, when I, I think what we got from from Zoom was instead of getting the screen, we were getting something else. And when I posted the video, there was no information there. So, uh, so what I did was I, I found some videos that I have from, from last year and I uh, updated the links. So were you able to do access those or? Yeah, prof professor, this morning I tried to watch those videos and they, it, it was the same one, the same, uh, that's not working. Okay, because if uh, you can see my screen here, and the reason I'm asking is because uh, if I go to, Modules. Yeah, so this is for Monday, April 11th. These are the two links. And when I go here, I open this. It takes me to the YouTube. And then you get the, the video. So it says, I mean, from oh, I my, see. Yeah, it's working now. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I got an email from a student on Saturday, and I edited those links on Saturday. So if you if you weren't if you went into the Zoom, I'm sorry, if you went to the modules on on Saturday or Sunday, you should be able to get those videos. Um, so I apologize for the uh, for posting that link. I just took it directly from, I downloaded the video from Zoom and uploaded to Zoom to YouTube and posted the link, uh, assuming that it was uh, just uh, the video from the class. Um, so, okay, so let's do that. I will, I will extend the, um, the deadline. Now you have both videos there. Those are the ones that uh, the assignment was referring to uh, from last year. So you should be able to complete the assignment now, yes. 
the period? Yeah, so that was a good question I'm getting from, from several of you. If you look at, at the set F, little f n, the number of periods will be the number of num uh, the yeah, the amount of numbers that you have in that set because you have one per period. So for the first problem, I think it was four, for the other one was three or or the other way around. Yeah. So so that's how you get the number of periods. Yes. Good questions. Yeah, yeah. So typically you will, I mean, you can state it clearly, but if you know the meaning of the set, you should be able to know that that's the number of periods, yes. Provide a chance for number three because it shows like, so assuming it goes off the, the lecture example, it shows the speed that it goes one way, but um, it, it seems like there's a certain number. Uh, so for problem number three, that's where you use the, the Poisson, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, let me open the, the assignment. Okay, so in this one, you have a, a conveyor loop and data given for the Poisson conveyor model. Professor, your screen isn't shared if, if you're sorry. trying to. Thank you for letting me know. I think that's what happened last time. Start sharing. There you go. Okay, so this is the Poisson conveyor model discussing in the video. So that's, I get what you're, you're saying now. Uh, so this is the example that we discussed in class. Assuming clock, clockwise uh, conveyor travel. Uh, so we have a clockwise direction, just like the, the one that we have um, in class. Um, we show that the conveyor speed must exceed uh, 45 windows per minute or 90 FPM in order for the conveyor loop to be stable. Suppose the direction of the conveyor is reverse. That is the conveyor travels counterclockwise. Determine the minimum conveyor. So the, the idea now is the, the conveyor is not gonna be rotating in the same direction. So the segments that you have to define for your conveyor are gonna be different now. Because remember, all the segments will have to end in a loading or overloading station. So by changing the direction, you also have to change the, se uh, the segments now. So uh, for example, if I go to, See this, um, so I think I have a better picture here. <clears throat> okay, so um, um, let me change this, display settings, duplicate. Okay, so if you look at, this is the example that I'm referring to. If you look at the, at the conveyor picture on top right side of the, of the slide, um, we have colored the segments, yellow, blue, green, and orange. And as you can see, this conveyor is rotated in a clockwise direction. And each one of the stations, um, sorry, each one of the segments will end in one loading or unloading station, right? So the blue one will start in 12 and will end in loading station number two. Uh, the green one will start in 29 and will end in unloading station 35 and so on. So when you change the direction now, um, those segments now will, will, uh, will be defined um, differently. Um, so for example, you will see that segment, um, segment blue, the blue segment right now, if you are moving in the opposite direction, you cannot start 
that segment in 28. You'll have to start it in 27. And that segment will end in 11. Because the segment has to end in one loading or the own loading station. So just by changing that detail, you're changing the configuration of the problem. And making that change, defining the segments, you have to find out now if, um, in order to answer the question, you have to solve the problem again. We the, the probability values, yes, they're the same. They stay the same. Yeah, so everything else is the same. You just have to solve the problem now using the different configuration for the segments. Yes, so yeah, the, so the segment per se, the the um the the length will be the same, but the configuration of where it starts and where it ends is different. So traffic will will be impacted now, uh, and the solution will change when you start looking at the which segments are being used. That will change because now the the um, circulation is different. So for example, those decisions that we are uh, making in terms of Z, now those are gonna be different. Those ones will not be the same as the ones you had before, okay? So you will solve the problem, same way we solved this one, but now you have a different direction and the segments are defined differently. And you'll see what the impact is. Does that clarify the question? Good. So, so I, in the videos, even though, I mean, we went through all this in class. Uh, however, in the video, there's two parts. In the first part of the video, which are again from last year, you will see that we cover the material. And then on the second video, we go in detail on how we got the, uh, the values for the decision variables and so on. And so both videos are connected in one, We'll go over the general description and the solution of the problem, but then I'll go into the details in the second video. Okay, so I, I will extend the, uh, the deadline for the assignment six, and, and then we'll go back to, um, so if you have questions on Wednesday, we can go back to it. Uh, it's not it's not a problem. Always remember that I have office hours. I'm not not seeing a lot of you during my office hours. So I, I see my students from the other class in the office hours almost every day. But in this class, for some reason, I don't see too many of you. So office hours are Mondays and Wednesdays. Monday morning from nine to ten, three thirty to four thirty. Today I saw one of you connecting, but it was like 9.55 and I, I was already with another student. So I was not able to, to get to, the, I mean, when I finished with the other student, the, the student who was waiting already uh, left. So I'll, I'm there. If you are not able to join, you're, you're gonna be there in the waiting room until I finish with the, uh, the other student. But typically I will spend like from five to 10 minutes talk with, with the student. Um, so, so that's it. Um, and then if you don't have availability during that time, then send me an email and we can schedule a, an appointment on a different time. Um, so for today, we, we are continuing the, and again, I need to apologize. Last Wednesday, I was not feeling, I mean, I, I was feeling well on Tuesday in the morning, I was feeling terrible. So I decided to stay home, apologize for that. But if you have questions about the material we cover on Wednesday, feel free to send me an email and we can we can talk or go to the to my office hours. Uh, but today we're gonna do a, a continuation of the discussion. We we started the topic on warehouse space and layout planning. Um, 
and this is going to be part two of this lecture um, in which we are now focusing on the uh, warehouse and the operations of the warehouse and, and what are the things that we can do to uh, make a warehouse more efficient in terms of layout decisions and facilities planning. So this is all go back to our um, understanding of principles of facility location, facilities location layout and material handling systems and to practice designing facilities. Um, so in today's lecture, we're gonna see some, some math. Um, you know, there's a limitation for, not limitation, but there's, there's some concepts that are needed to understand some of the models or one, one of the models that we are gonna discuss today. Um, typically uh, in industrial engineering, we teach uh, those concepts in operational research, but it's not something too difficult. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring those that discussion to class in a minute. Uh, but these problems that we are gonna discuss today can be solved using a mathematical optimization model. Typically, those are models in which you have an objective function that you're trying to optimize, like you wanna maximize uh, the, or minimize the cost, or you wanna minimize the distance travel. And then you have some mathematical equations that are gonna be, you, gonna be used as constraints that are gonna let you know, okay, you can solve this problem under these boundaries. And then you're gonna try to find the best solution for this problem under these boundaries. Um, and you can formulate a problem mathematically under an objective function and constraints. And then you have some decision variables that are gonna tell you if you want to maximize this objective function, these are the decisions that you need to make. We teach those concepts in operation research. Um, if you are in a, I mean, if you're making a minor in math, those, that course is also offered, I think, within uh, the math department. Uh, and then we, we can solve those in different ways using the computer or, or manually using uh, a, the simplex method. Okay, so for, for today, we're looking, we're looking again into the design of a warehouse, the warehouse layout model, and then uh, storage system. So towards the end of the lecture, we are gonna spend some time talking about some of the material handling equipment that are uh, specifically for warehouse design. Um, so the objective for, for today's lecture is to learn, learn warehouse operations improvement through the application of best practice procedures and available material handling systems for warehousing operations. So how many of you have had the opportunity to look at, I mean, visit a warehouse, uh, industry warehouse? Good. So you, you, you see that there's a lot of things uh, happening, right? Typically warehouse is a very active uh, op area of the, of the company because you have product moving in and moving out. Um, there's a lot of uh, equipment configuration uh, layout decisions that are typically made. So with the goal of obviously keeping safe the, the inventory and also maximizing the, the space utilization. Uh, so as an introduction, we can list the type of storage in three uh, categories. Those are listed here. Uh, so the first one, is what is called randomized or floating storage. This is used when a product unit um, can be stored in any available storage location. So a randomized means that if you have a space, you can use it. It doesn't matter uh, what type of product you have in hand. So, um, so that's what it stands for. And there is an, uh, basically on the other side of the description or the other side of the philosophy is this dedicated storage in which uh, is used when a unit of product is assigned to a specific storage location or set of locations. So in this case, if you have a rack and it's always used to storage computers, you will not bring another product into that rack because you know that area is occupied just by that product. It doesn't matter if it's empty, it doesn't matter if it's not utilized, you know that if it's not a computer, you're not gonna put it there. Uh, and then there's uh, variations of these two, uh, of dedicated storage and randomized. So storage according to a part number sequence, 
and storage according to the level of activity, meaning the storage retrievals per unit time and the inventory level. So in general, these are the three uh, major uh, differences for uh, categories of storage. So if I were to describe this with a picture, I think this is showing the difference, right? So um, we have the input and the output ducts located in the same position or in the same area of the warehouse. And then you can see that for dedicated storage, you have a very well uh, colored definition for the different type of products. Whereas in the random storage, it's, it's not like that. You have different colors everywhere. So you will see, I mean, if you think about it, it's not hard to see that in terms of operations, dedicated storage will be easier for an operator to go find the product, right? Because you know where to, where to look for it and where to find it. Uh, whereas in the random storage, you need to spend more time if you are not aware of where you're putting things or someone else is doing that for you, then finding the problem might take you a longer time. However, if you think about space utilization, one of them, random storage, will give you more flexibility and you will be able to uh, put more product into the same space because you are not um, separating a, an idle space for a specific type of product. So that being said, from a warehouse perspective, objective for warehouse layout planning, we want to have a space effectiveness. So this in, in the sense of maximizing this space utilization. This costs money, okay? So everywhere you see a warehouse, that's, that's money right there because it's very expensive to run a warehouse. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you have the best uh, layout in place and that you're using that space as much as possible because you wanna make sure that that is used efficiently. Uh, for example, when working with the uh, food banks, they have a, an area, one of them in Austin, the one in Austin, they have a, an area that is like a, a freezer. Right, they have a very uh, cold temperature inside this area and it's typically used for products. So if they get donations for produce or meat, they can put it in there. Uh, but those type of donations are not very uh, common. Like they will come from time to time from some donors, let's say supermarkets, uh, but there's not like they're gonna be receiving a ton of meat or, or produce every day. So, they need to have the space for when they get those donations to store them, but it's not an area that is well utilized. You will say that way. Uh, so what they started doing in order to get some cost savings into, into this area was to rent some of the space. Like if you have a company that needs uh, an area with those conditions, you can rent some of those spa that space and then you recover some of the cost of operating that area. So that can tell you, even for nonprofit um, institutions, it's very important to make use of the space, especially when you are in cities like Austin where it is very expensive. Uh, material handling efficiency is also an, another objective for warehouse cost minimization, flexibility, and obviously uh, housekeeping. So, on the next slide, this is what I was discussing before. We're gonna discuss the quantitative warehouse layout planning model. So this is a optimization model that was developed for the uh, design of a warehouse. And again, goes back to the definition of some of these uh, objective functions, decision variables and constraints in order to solve uh, the problem. So. What I will do now is I'm going to state the model, but as and maybe you don't know, but in operation research optimization, um, typically, if you have a mathematical model, you can have uh, a determined size in which you can solve quickly. Like if you're looking at a space that has, let's say, five departments and you have a sharing of, of information or sharing of product between those five areas. That's something that you can solve quickly in a computer. But at some point, 
as you keep adding areas and products and so on into the model, at some point that problem is going to grow exponentially in size and it's going to be very difficult to be solved. So typically what we do is to try to develop some algorithm that can maybe not give you the optimal solution, but give you a good solution that you can use in practice. So what we are going to do today is we're going to be, we, I'm going to state the model, the optimization problem that if you solve it using a computer, will give you the optimal solution for your design. But again, that might not be something that you can use in practice. So we are also going to discuss an algorithm that can help you solve that problem and will give you a good solution for, for your problem. So let's talk about the uh, quantitative warehouse planning, layout planning model. Um, so any kind of storage is a set of storage locations assigned to a specific product. So that's the type of, of problem that we want to solve. And then we're gonna have a decision variable that is gonna be binary X, J, K that is gonna be equal to one if product J is assigned to location K and it's gonna be zero otherwise. So for each product, you're gonna have a decision variable that is gonna look at every possible location in which you can put this product. So again, if you have a hundred products and 50 locations, this problem is gonna be huge. So it's gonna grow exponentially. If you have 10 products and five locations, the problem can be something that you can manage uh, and solve easily. So, so we have the decision variable and a measure of the effectiveness is to minimize the total expected distance travel. So that means that you have to put things into the warehouse and also you have to take that, those products from the warehouse and send it to the truck so they can be delivered. So there's a lot of uh, movement happening and you wanna minimize that distance that needs to be traveled in order to do all those uh, movements inside the warehouse. Yes, sir. Do you see this breaking this apart when you start to use different variable sets based on size of them? Because my products are, you know, one by one or within a range of like one by two square feet versus massive pallets. Yeah, that's a good question. So and you see how that works in a, in a minute. So you you will have to divide your warehouse into grids, right? And then you're gonna tell okay, this product is gonna occupy this many grids, and then solve the problem. That's a very good question. You solve the problem based on on that information. Um, so minimize the total expected distance travel is gonna be our, our objective. So we, we, want, we know we have the space, we have the product. So where we need to place these products into the warehouse so we can minimize this uh, distance travel. So um, the input data, we have Q is the total number of storage locations. N is the number of products. M is the number of input output points. And these are gonna be our, our docs. Um, SJ is the number of storage locations required by product J. So this is what I was referring to. So depending on the, on the size of the product, we are gonna determine how many uh, storage locations. Uh, TJ is the number of trips in, out of the storage for products. So if you have a product that is um, very popular and needs to move a lot, then that value is expected to be high. And then if you have a product that is not as popular, then you see that that problem might, might not be uh, as, well, uh, it would not be moved as much. P is the percentage of travel in and out of the storage from point I. So again, we're referring to these uh, um, locations for the in and out input outputs. And the distance of or DIK is the distance or time required to travel from point I to location K. Uh, so as a note, this uses uh, rectilinear distances between storage centroids. Uh, so typically when you arrange the warehouse, you will have these hallways that are more or less aligned and you will 
be traveling these rectilinear distances. Uh, but if you have a different configuration uh, in terms of uh, how these things are located, then uh, remember that this algorithm is, is based on these, or this model is based on rectilinear distances. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, let's let's talk about the, the model, mathematical model itself. Um, this will be it's a it's a, what we call an integer programming model because we have integer binary variables. And variable as stated earlier is x j k and it's going to be equal to one if product j is assigned to location k Okay, so typically when we de um, we derive these optimization models, in this case, an integer programming model, we follow this structure in which we define first the set and the parameters, which is what we did in the previous slide. And then we use that to define the decision variables, the objective function and the constraints. So, the objective function. So this is what gonna is gonna guide our decisions. So the values of x, j, k are gonna change according to the objective function that I define for my problem. So if if I'm I want to mani maximize my profit, that might not give me the same decision as if I want to minimize the cost, right? Those decisions could be different because my objective is different. In this case, our objective function is to minimize the total distance travel, okay? So we want to minimize, this is gonna require the double summation for all products. and for all um, locations. Uh, but I need to do something else first. So this is not going to include this. So from J equals one up to N, you're gonna have this uh, multiplier here with this ratio, tj, hj, and then the summation from k equals one up to q. For i equals one, I is the input outputs. So we're gonna take into account all the input output locations in our warehouse, multiply that times the probability and the distance. And this has to be multiplied by our decision matter. So, our um, objective function, again, is trying to minimize the distance travel. It's going to take into account the number of products, the number of locations, uh, the number of input output locations that you have in your warehouse. And it's going to multiply all possible combinations of those um, doors, locations, and products. And it's going to search for the best combination 
uh, using the decision variable, right? So imagine that you have 100 uh, different combinations and then you're selecting only the ones that have a one for X, I, for X, J, K, right? So only the ones that have X, J, K equal to one are the ones that are gonna be selected. Those are the combinations or those are the locations that are going to give you the minimal distance travel, right? And what we're stating here is just the, um, the format of the problem, but to solve this, we're gonna have to use other algorithms. Um, so constraint. This is the third part. You have the summation from J equals one up to N X J K equals one. And this is for K equals one up to Q. And this constraint is basically forcing the problem to have only one product of type J store in each location. So if you, once you choose a location for a product, then you cannot assign that to another problem. That's what this constraint is trying to do. So it's gonna do all possible locations and product combinations in this equation. You're gonna do this for each location. So let's say for location one, you're gonna have a summation and you can only select a decision variable to be equal to one in order to meet this constraint. If you, if you make X, one, one equal to one, then the other one has to be zero for this constraint to be um, true. And you will find one X for each location in order to, I mean, the best product to assign to a specific location based on uh, the objective function that you are, uh, that we define. And then we have a second constraint there's two, only two constraints. This is the second. K from K equals to one up to Q. This is N. X, J, K will be equal to S, J. And this is for J equals one up to N. And this constraint is basically making sure that we assign the required number of storage locations to each product K. So if product J requires four locations or four spaces, we are making sure that we assign that to, to that product. If it requires 10, make sure that we assign that to that product. Um, so those are the two constraints. Okay, so as I mentioned already, this is a formulation of the problem. We have decision variables that are binary. So we can state that as well, X, J, K, are gonna be zero or one or J equals one up to N and also for K equals one up to Q. Um, so on the next slide, you'll have a clear uh, Formulation, I want to just to go step by step just to explain the model, but this is the, the formulation that we just discussed. Here you have the description of what each piece represents, but it's the same thing. We have the objective function, two constraints, and decision variables that are binary. 
Okay, so in the objective function, we have these P's right here. Um, so as I mentioned, when we try to um, solve these problems, if the problems are too big, they're, they become difficult to solve. So now we want to devise or derive a, a way to solve this problem without relying on these optimization software packages and so on. So what we're gonna discuss now is uh, the idea behind the algorithm that we're gonna use to solve this problem. So as you can see, this is the objective function in which we are trying to minimize the expected distance travel between in the warehouse. So in here, you see that we have a coefficient that is multiplied by the decision variable, that's the k. So this is what's going to be forcing or basically deciding these, these amounts are the ones that are gonna be deciding whether or not you select a zero or a one for this decision map. So if this is too big and you're trying to minimize, you're not gonna make this equal to one. You're gonna make this equal to zero. If this is small, then more likely that you are gonna make this equal to one because you are trying to minimize. So a big number here is going to go in the opposite direction of minimizing. Small number here is going to help you minimize the distance. So that's what the algorithm is trying is going to try to do. It's going to be looking at these coefficients, and you're going to say, okay, is this coefficient small related to the other ones? If the answer is yes. Then I'll, I want to keep this combination as a possible solution. Um, so, so we can re reformulate this constraint as stated here, in which we uh, separate um, or we replace this uh, PI times ZIK by this FK coefficient. And then what we end up having when we expand this, um, this equation is just the multiplication of this coefficient TJ over SJ times this summation. Okay, so knowing that we can devise a solution procedure that is stated here. Uh, so these are the three steps. We're gonna um, start by relabeling, we relabel the products one, two, three, up to N, according to the non-increasing order of their TJSJ values. Okay, so no increasing order of ti of tj divided by asj so we're going to start with the uh, bigger ones and then continue with the smaller ones and then find the values of fk the expected distance travel between location k and, and dot and the docks and then assign the locations to products according to the their f values from lowest to highest okay so as i mentioned the low value is good because it's going to minimize the objective function, large value is gonna be bad. So you wanna make sure that you assign the locations first according to the lowest F value. So let's, let's look at one example. So here we have the warehouse dimensions. We have a 40 feet by 40 feet storage uh, or warehouse. And then storage locations are 10 by 10. We have one receiving dock at the northeast corner of the layout and one shipping dock at the midpoint of the west side. And we have two products, A and B. Product A requires 10 pallets per week. Product B, 80 pallets per week. Uh, product A requires 10 storage bays uh, and product B requires four storage bays. Okay, so very simple, uh, only two products, small warehouse, uh, storage locations are um, about 10 by 10. So the idea again is to illustrate how to apply the algorithm. So this is what we have to work with. We have these uh, locations. It's a 40 by 40 storage location with 10 by 10 um, storage locations. And um, we are going to assume that 50% uh, of the trips 
this is the probability into the warehouse are for going in and 50% of the trips are for moving product out. So we are going to um, compute these FK values are going to be equal to the summation from i equals 1 m d i d i k and this is for k equals 1 up to m okay so we, we are going to start by computing those values so what that means is for every location in the warehouse, we have to compute an FK value. Okay, so in this case, we have 16. So we have to compute that F value for each one of them from one to 16. Obviously, I'm not gonna do all of them. I'm gonna do around five of those. Then you will have to work on those on yourself for the rest of them. So for this particular warehouse, then we only have two doors. This is the door going in, and this is the door going out. So product will go in from the top, product will go out from this side, uh, as defined here. One receiving dock and one shipping dock on the west side in the middle. Um, so we are going to have FK since we only have two doors, we're going to have two um, parameters per equation, P1 times D1K plus P2 times D2K. So we can start with the first one, F1. Okay, so this will be for this location. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna have, we're gonna assume that 50% of the trips are for um, getting product in, and then 50% of the trips are gonna be to pull product out of the warehouse. So those are the probabilities that I'm gonna use for the input and the output, 50% and 50%. So this is gonna be 0.5. And then for my first distance, I need to look at the distance from the centroid of the warehouse bay location I need to add that distance from that centroid to the location of the door. So for example, here we have this centroid. This is 5, 15, 25, 35, and 40. So this is going to be times 40. Plus to the second door, again, 50% probability of moving product out, 5, 15, 20. So this F value equals 10. So the F value for the first bay is 10. Now I have to repeat the process for all of them. So let's do this one. So we'll move down up to F9. I'm choosing one um, randomly, but again, you have to do this for every single square in the warehouse. So F9 will be from this point 
So we have to travel up to the this door. 5, 15, 25, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. So it's gonna be 0.5 times 60 plus 0.5 times 5, 10. So this is gonna be equal to 35. So this B value of F9 is 35. Um, so if you do F of 13, that'll be this one. That's gonna be equal to 0.5 times 50 plus 0.5 times 40. And that's gonna be 45. Sorry, this is 13. This is wrong. Thirteen is five times seventy is twenty, and this is forty-five. And fifteen, this one right here. So this is forty-five for fifteen. This is gonna be zero point five. Again, the probability times the distance, which is fifty, plus the probability point five times. 40, and this is 45. Okay, who wants to do 16? I'll give you two bonus points for the next exam. Anybody wants to try to do it here in the, the board? Just go ahead. There's more markers here. Yeah, he got it. The smaller the number, the better. The smaller the number, the better the location, right? Because it's minimizing the distance. So once we get the, the grid, and we know which locations are the best. Now we can look at the products that have more or largest movement or are moving the most, and we can assign those products to these best locations. Okay, so is a two way or two step or two state type of solution, right? You first define what are the best locations, and you look at the products that are being moved the most and you try to assign those to those locations. So, so blue is right. Um, so you might send me an email and I'll make sure that I get back for next time or for the next exam. So it's 45, 45 times 40, times 0.5 times 50, and again, still 45. So this is this one. So in a, in a problem, you have to look at every single uh, square. This is something that you can program in an Excel spreadsheet, for example, and then you input the information, should be able to drag the equation and get the the right answers. Um, but for the purpose of 
illustration, you see what's going on. Um, so if you complete the process, I'm oh, sorry. So we are going into uh, the next step. So let's assume that we have all this. So I'll put those numbers here. Um, this will be 30, 30, 30. And based on the location of the doors and also based on the probabilities. Okay, so at this point we are saying 50% product will go in all the time, 50% product will go out, but those ratios can differ. Maybe you have more movement um, going in, going out, and also the location of the doors will be different. So you see this guy right here, pretty far from both doors. So that's why the F value is higher. Same thing with guys at the bottom, but those around close to both of them will have a smaller value. Yes. So these are not, uh, I mean, basic, uh, how do you like this? this? Yeah, what does that mean? Okay, so you have to look at the distances from the centroid to each one of the doors. Oh, so that will be five and five, that's 10, 20, 30, 40, right? And then from here, five, 15, 25, 30, 35, 45, 50. That makes sense? Okay. So once we get those, we get the values here. And now the next thing is to look at the ratio for each product. So in this case, in this case, we have two products. Um, if we go back to this, we're gonna relabel the products according to the non-increasing value of TJ by SJ. Do you remember? TJ is the number of trips in and out of storage for product J. SJ is the number of storage location required by the product. So we are gonna use a ratio of TJ by SJ to determine which product should be located first and then which products will be located next based on that ratio. So if we, if we look at that ratio, for A we have, TA by SA equals 10, or B is TB, uh, SB equals 20. So given that this value is higher, we are gonna start with, with this product first. And we need to locate, uh, so consider product B first and product B second, I'm sorry, product A second. So we are going to, because of the ratio, TBSB is greater than TASA. So, how many bays are needed by B? Four. So, I need to locate these four first and then locate the rest of them for the other product. So, if I'm going to assign this, this is a different color. So it looks like we have eight bays that are have the same value, which is 30. So I can choose any of them for my first product. Okay, so I will put this here, B, 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 and B. If you choose a different configuration, but you're still selecting a bay with the 30 value, still right. Okay, it's not, it, I'm not expecting you to have the same configuration of you. 
But the important thing is that you choose the right number for the for the product. Mm -hmm. And then we have 10 days that are needed for product A. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in this case, it is important that you choose all the 31st, then the next 35. And then at the end, you have the 45. You have two A's that are empty. You want to make sure that those two are with the highest value in the, in the warehouse. OK? If you end up choosing these two and leaving these two empty, that's incorrect. Because you want to choose the ones that have the best location. Does that make sense? OK. So this is the solution for this problem. There's a, a similar problem discussed in the, in the textbook. So this is for you to do um, just for additional uh, practice. You can look at this example. Um, has to verify the calculations and verify the solution for, for both for that problem. Questions? Okay, good. So we have few minutes so we can get through the last part of the um, of this lecture. So again, this is going back to this, this rest a little bit. Uh, we can go back to this next time again, just to clarify uh, questions. There's gonna be an assignment on on this. So I think it's already posted so you can look at, the, at those problems. Please try to solve those. During the week, over the weekend, I check my email, but it's not something that I will do frequently. So if you contact me during the week, you will get a better service from my end. If over the weekend, it's a little bit difficult. So, so look at the assignment. If, if you um, have questions, we can talk on Wednesday and also, uh, or Thursday or Friday. If you have questions, we can set up an appointment. So going back into the, Material handling lecture that we cover. This is a part that is focusing on warehouse. Um, so storage systems in particular for warehouses. Um, so we talk about rack storage systems. This is one of the primary methods for material storage. And the good thing about this is it utilizes the vertical space in the warehouse. So it's efficient in terms of costs. Uh, so, because you're not just using your uh, X space, but also the Y space in the warehouse. Uh, there's different rack types. Uh, I think we mentioned all of them in this lecture, uh, where a uh, material handling lecture, fall through racks, pushback racks, very narrow aisle racks, driving racks, and gravity flow racks. Um, these mobile racks, double deep racks, load out and real racks, and cantilever racks. Uh, so here's an example of a walkthrough rack. Uh, so again, try to use as much space as we mentioned at the beginning. Space is costly, so you want to make use of efficiently of the space. And this provides ability to the adjacent aisles. Speaking time is greatly reduced, allows for more light leaning to the aisles and higher utilization of the vertical space. Because again, you're also utilizing that space that you're leaving as a hallway. Uh, the pushback racks, uh, again, accessibility, you can get your product on this side and then the rest of the product will move forward. Um, so features, pallet loads are literally pushed back into the rack. When pallet is retrieved, the deeper pallet load automatically advances to the aisle, high density and high accessibility. This is used to store large number of pallets for a long time time and then remove and ship them as seasonal product. And this is typically used in combination with the driving racks. Uh, the very narrow aisle racks, this is uh, kind of scary, uh, but yeah, it's used frequently. Uh, permits aisle width less than five feet, provides significant floor space reduction. So again, you're trying to use a minimal space as possible for the uh, hallways or the aisles. Uh, use a ties of 40 feet to 50 feet 
policies are accessed with turret or side loaded bridge trucks, and sometimes racks are designed with a top and bottom monorail. The driving rack, these are common. These are, uh, you can see those in Lowe's Home Depot, also stands. Uh, so you have the forklift basically loading into these areas. Uh, this is used for bulky and lightweight parts. Parts are mainly in cartons. Uh, forklifts is the material handling device used. Parts are typically stacked one over the other in large numbers. Uh, the gravity flow racks, I mean, similar to the pushback, um, use for parts in cartons, parts are supported on rollers in the rack systems. Material transfers is done with easy. Uh, it's easy to move parts along the same row as less effort is required due to the presence of the rollers. Uh, this one is uh, also allows you to save uh, a lot of space because uh, these are the mobile racks. They can be moved according to the need, but again, requires a, a lot of uh, work in terms of finding the right location and then accessing that location for the movement. Uh, so you see these things will roll uh, back and forth depending on which side you wanna access. Uh, these are for high density storage systems, 100% uh, utilization of pilot positions, Storage carriers are driven by electric motors, used mainly in cold or ultra cold warehouse where aisle space is a premium. So this is referring back to what I mentioned in, in the uh, food banks. Those areas that require um, climate conditions that are cold are very expensive. So you wanna make sure that you use that space as much as possible, or if you are not using it, you find a way to reduce the cost. Uh, use when speed of product movement is not a major concern, right? So, because you need all, to do all these processes in order to access the product. Double deep racks um, is like placing two rows of racks together. Use uses a deep reach lift truck for storage and retrieval. Increases floor space usage for about 60 to 65 percent. Uh, use for high throughput operations. Again, a lot of movement. Uh, low initial cost, high productivity, and less equipment damage. Uh, rollout shelf, rollout shelf racks. These are for products that are uh, very um, delicate, I would say, but you have to make sure that are not damaged. Uh, so specialized storage, mainly for delicate and costly part, used for dyes, measurement tools, and so on. Uh, the real racks. Uh, for utilities companies, you see this power companies and so on. This is you have these rolls uh, stacks. Uh, this is a special type of storage, mainly for cables and wires in rails. Um, cantilever racks. These for pipes or for products that are long. So these are typically you will find those also in these uh, flows on depot. Uh, used for store long pipes and wood parts are stored using the forklifts. Highly economical and can be used to heights of 22 feet. Um, and then the carousel storage. These are more specialized type of storage. Uh, very expensive. Uh, this provides some advantages: high peak rates, motorized computer control, and independent rotated aisles and shelving. So for example, HEV here in San Marcos will have these type of carousel storage. Um, parts are carried to the picker rather than the picker going into the parts, like in the case of the racks, mostly set up in pots of two or three, and peak rates vary from 80 to 200 picks per person. Um, so these advantages, adding more people cannot significantly increase the peak rate because again, you are, you are limited by the, the movement and the speed of the carousel. Only one picker can operate at a given time, thus reduce the, the ability of the warehouse to respond to surges in demand. So this is how it looks. So this will rotate. If you need a part from here, it will bring it to the front and you will be able to collect from it. Um, 
It is a series of rotating beams of adjustable shelves driven on the top and bottom by a motor. Rotation takes place on an AC perpendicular to the floor, about 80 feet per minute. Horizontal length vary from 15 to 100 feet. Height varies from 6 feet to 25 feet. And prices start from 5,000 and increases with the number of beams and the weight capacity. Uh, automated storage and retrieval system, uh, improved space utilization, 55% of wrap space can be recovered, high saving in pickers time, uh, allows quick access uh, to good via system of shelves operating in a shuttle mechanism. It brings the exact pick store location to the operator, increases retrieval productivity by more than 2.5 times. This again, very expensive. Uh, access area of the system is ergonomically designed to present storage system at an ideal height for the picking. So this is the type of system that you will see in Amazon, for example, high employee safety and improved throughput. Uh, so here's the picture. And that's the, uh, the end of today's lecture. Any questions? So again, I'm going to extend the deadline for the, the assignment that was due today until Wednesday. So you have until Wednesday to submit that assignment. If you already did, you have time to revise it. And then we'll talk more on Wednesday. Have a good afternoon.